hi, George. Welcome to the Now Show. I so appreciate you taking the time to connect with me. And maybe just start by telling us like where you are right now in the world. So right now, I'm in my home island of Cyprus, which is a tiny island in the Mediterranean. I always feel like I have to say that because when I tell people I'm from Cyprus, they're like, oh, is that a village? I'm like, no, <laughs> it is a country. <laughs> <laughs> That's like why people think we live in igloos. I'm like, no, like it's there cold, we go. but we, not everyone in Canada lives in igloos. Cyprus is not a tiny village. <laughs> yes, it is an island and an actual country. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, so my friend actually sent me your Instagram. She must follow like your posts and things. And I hadn't talked to her in probably like eight years or something. So I'm like, okay, like if you're connecting to me at this time right now and you're telling me I need to connect to this person, I'm on it. So <laughs> I love that. I love how interconnected we are, especially with what's going around in the world right now. The fact that you were able to have a conversation like from like thousands of miles away, it's just amazing. It is just amazing. And then I started looking through your profile and I've seen that the title light workers gotta work i'm like finally someone's not feeding people bullshit <laughs> here we go <laughs> this is the first copy i got the other day i'm so excited oh it looks so great so how did you just decide like what you wanted the cover to look like first of all it has to be it had to be based on what the title of the book is and what the message is and as mm -hmm. the title says light workers gotta work so the whole point of me writing this book was I want to communicate this message that yes, it's so important to meditate, to spend time receiving guidance from source. But unless we do something with that guidance, then all we're really doing is light chilling. We're not light workers because, you know, <laughs> light worker has been such, is such a buzzword right now. Everybody's like, oh, I'm a light worker, I'm a light worker. And sometimes that means posting inspirational posts on Instagram. And that's not what light work is all about. I believe that light work has to be balanced in feminine and masculine energy. It has to have mm -hmm. the feminine side of connecting, receiving guidance, but also using that guidance to take physical, real action in the world to do that. Drawing from that perspective, I'm like, how do I portray this most accurately? So here we have a light worker in, represented by a girl holding the globe and just creating change in the world because the subheading is, the ultimate guide to following your purpose and creating change in the world. Because collectively, light workers, our collective purpose is to create a positive change in the world, to help in the ascension of the planet so that we create a kinder, and more peaceful, and more loving world. And we do this by working our life. I feel like I'm already breathing easier hearing you talk. I'm like, yes, he's right. <laughs> so going back to all that you said and what i said before that about finally pete someone isn't feeding people bullshit because that's what i feel like people are like oh light workers you just sit there and you know it just automatically comes out of you and there's like too much surrender i want to say like and it's so blah and it's like no it's actually a lot of hard work like you have to find, yes, that feeling and that drive, but then where does it lead you? You have to find the dots. You have to connect them. You have to talk to the people, come up with an idea, put it into motion, all those things. So what would you say is for light workers with this new message of like, yes, you got to work. Where did that come from in your personal life? How did you decide like, oh yeah, I do have to work too. And I'm a light worker. Do you know why I think many light workers, many spiritual seekers are afraid of working their light. It has to do with years and years, like lives and lives, I'm talking about past lives right now, where we've been victimized by the patriarchal forces of the world. Because like a short, like a history lesson here, like patriarchy has been in existence for over 6,000 years. And that basically means that masculine energy, that energy of taking action, moving mm -hmm. forward, structure, creation has been abused. And it has at the same time abused what feminine energy is. So feminine energy is all the qualities of nurturing ourselves, of 
of supporting ourselves, listening to our intuition. It is very free, unstructured way of being and, and living, which is very, it's a very creative energy. And we can see how nature uh, finds the balance between these two energies so potently during the winter, everything is just resting, that's feminine. And during the summer and spring, everything is coming into uh, full bloom and fruition, which is what masculine energy is. So for 6,000 years, approximately, mm -hmm. feminine energy has been suppressed. And we have been, light workers, uh, we have been the victims of that, which has been burned at the stake. Healers having to suppress their healing abilities. Uh, mm -hmm. Wizards and mages and shamans having to suppress our authenticity in order to make it in a patriarchal world. So all of a sudden, a group of light workers that in the book I call Ascension Light Workers. It's a very it's a specific group of old mature light workers that have been coming uh, into the world in the past few decades with the aim of helping this upgrade of the planet. We are feeling all this suppression from our past lives. We come with this expectation, and we're like, you know what? We're not gonna let masculine energy. Uh, get us again. We're going to work on uplifting feminine energy because we can see this is what's missing from the world. However, because we haven't experienced what a balanced world looks like because the world has been polarized for so long, we don't know how a balanced world looks like. What we do know, though, is that we, the world needs more feminine energy. So without knowing the big picture, without having the end goal uh, in mind, we just overwork on uplifting feminine energy. Mm -hmm. And we put so much emphasis in bringing that energy into the world. So we're like, divine feminine is rising. Goddess, praise the goddess, forgot about the gods. You know, all the pagan religions, they have gods and goddesses. No, forgot about the gods, it's just the gods. <laughs> because we know that's what's missing. But what I want light workers and spiritual seekers to just allow themselves to consider is that if we just focus on the feminine, won't we create yet another imbalance? Won't we end up at some point shifting from patriarchy to matriarchy? And do we really want that? So this is what I realized with myself. Personally, you asked me, how did this, how did this manifest personal in my life? I found myself at a time, a few years ago, I was working a full-time job while working on my spiritual business part-time. And I have been overworking myself and exhausting myself every single year mm -hmm. for three years, working a nine to five job and then coming home and working until midnight on my thing and then doing it all over again. And then I had an epiphany when I woke up one morning and I couldn't move because I was so fatigued. Like I was, I'm, I was allowing masculine energy patriarchy to still control me in a very subtle, subversive way because it is so embedded into culture, into the world that I was abusing it without even realizing it. And that's when I realized, oh my God, I need to change. I need to learn to embrace the feminine. And long story short, I explain in the book the whole story of how I found out that I heard something that did not make sense at the time had made perfect sense afterwards, which was, George, you're gonna find the feminine within the masculine. And I'm like, what does that even mean? And that's when I realized there are two sides of the same coin. Masculine mm -hmm. energy is feminine when it's balanced, when it's healthy. And feminine energy is masculine when mm -hmm. it's balanced. Because feminine energy, when it's unbalanced, it's procrastination. Masculine energy, when it's unbalanced, it's aggression and hassle and overwork. When they're balanced, when feminine energy is balanced, it's not procrastination. You're taking action on the mm -hmm. intuition you're receiving. So it's at the same time masculine. Masculine energy, when it's balanced, it's feeding off of the intuitive guidance there for feminine energy. So it's two sides of the same coin. So that's when I realized, okay, I need to find balance in masculine and feminine energy. I need to embrace the feminine but I have to do this through the masculine. So it's basically finding the perfect balance between the two, not in an energetic way, not just in an energetic way, but in a practical way. That means on a day-to-day -day basis, how much time am I spending on my spiritual practice versus how much time am I spending working? So in the book, in Light Workers Gotta Work, it's a very practical book. It's full of processes. The first part is about finding your purpose because that is a goal. 
The second part is about nurturing feminine energy and therefore nurturing your light. Third part is about working your light practically. Like I, it's full of manifestation processes we can use to do that. And then the fourth part is about protecting our light, which is a whole different topic on energy protection. But essentially, it's a practical manual of balancing these two aspects within us. Mm -hmm. I love that. Like way back, I think it was like last March, um, me and Fabian, we were in Paris and I wrote this blog about that, about how we don't want to to now be this feminine is only just leading and now the men are being put down here. You're so right. We don't want one above the other. It's all about working together and that's really pure balance and pure bliss. How yes. are some ways that you like, do put, apply that to your life? Like what does your day look like, week look like, month? What are some boundaries you have, communication you use? Like some ways that you put that into action. Okay, thank you for asking this question because I've structured my daily life and my weekly life and my yearly life based on the practices in the book in the sense that it has to be balanced between masculine and feminine energy. So my days are balanced this way, my weeks are balanced this way, my month and the entire year. Now, I'm not going to go into how I plan the entire year. Let's start with mm -hmm. a simple day. So I start my day with my spiritual practice. That is my non-negotiable feminine time. Because I'm a very, my energy is very masculine in nature. I'm a Leo, I'm all about fire, moving forward, taking action. I have to create consciously time to be feminine. Otherwise, I just go full on into a hustle. So I schedule my feminine time, which is a masculine way of creating feminine time, which works mm -hmm. amazingly for people who are like me. Okay, so every single morning, because I work from home and for myself, I can take three hours of my spiritual practice. You don't need to do that if you have like a proper job. <laughs> like, I mean, if you yeah. like go, like have a corporate job, that's what I meant to say. Like you can I knew what you least, meant. Yes, you can at least have 15 minutes. And when people tell me, oh, I don't have time. I'm like, well, you do have time to feel like shit. So if you have time to feel like shit, you have time to feel good as well. Because you have time to take the shit out. <laughs> yes, because that's what a spiritual practice is. It is a happiness practice. Spirituality is a journey of remembering the happiness that is already us. It's not within us. It is us. Mm -hmm. So it's just a practice of remembering that on a daily basis. So I start my spiritual practice right there. On my, on my altar, I do my rituals, I call upon my gods and my goddesses, I light up a candle, I set my intention, maybe I give myself a reading, maybe I clear my energy with Palo Santo, I meditate, I work out, I read books, I just do something that's totally um, unproductive in the masculine sense of, of the term, but it's really quite productive because I'm, I'm my energy is readying itself to receive guidance that I'll use later on to work. And then after my three hours, I start at like 1 p.m. That's when I start working. That's when mm -hmm. I start uh, my day. And I do whatever I have to do during the day. But then during the evening, again, I create time to just go out with friends or to go out in nature or to allow myself to, uh, to unwind a little bit. So it's this perfect balance, this, this play between feminine and masculine and for people who are quite feminine in nature that's when you mm -hmm. have to schedule time to be masculine in nature and therefore use manifestation processes and take action towards your purpose and really work your light so i, I feel really called to share something from the book i have a diff like i distinguish between what working your light is and isn't so working your light is not meditating on world, on world peace mm -hmm. it's not visualizing a disadvantaged group of people healing it's not about um meditating all day long it's not about sending good vibes to people so this is not what working your light is that's nurturing the light and it's so important okay working your life is doing podcasts working your life mm -hmm. is writing books working your life is uh, creating courses and online workshops, working your life is sending letters to politicians, working your life is not supporting businesses and corporations 
that are abusing masculine energy, working your life is being part of peaceful demonstrations. So there is a, an element of action towards it. Now, what's important to note is that in the book, I don't talk about, oh, how to create your own course, how to mm -hmm. uh, do workshops and podcasts. The work your light section is all about manifestation processes that we can use to receive the inspiration about those action steps. So the entire section is full of my best manifestation processes that will help us use the light we've nurtured to receive inspired guidance on what action steps we need to take. That is wonderful. Oh, okay, like I need to read this. And so I have like an online book club that I do. So I'm like, maybe your book will be like May or something for us. Oh, <laughs> because, I would love that. <laughs> yeah, and I can like have you on in the group or something. <laughs> but yeah, people need to definitely read this book because I like how you word it, like working your light. People seem to think it's two separate things. Like there's work and then there's time for light. But or that light workers are just like doing nothing, but it's working your light. It's combining all that together. So that's exactly. just like the new way. Yes. Beautiful. And for you and you're receiving your guidance after or during the feminine time in the morning, what does your guidance feel like to you? Does it come in visions? Is there like messages? Hmm. Is there words? Is it a feeling? What is that for you? So I'm naturally claircognizant, but I develop my clairvoyance as well. So usually for me, I have downloads of thoughts. I just know stuff and I don't know how I know them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I see stuff. So it is a combination of things. And uh, I think, is it in this book that I do? No, it's not in this book. My first book, Be the Guru. I have an entire chapter all about, it's called Paying Your Intuition Fees. <laughs> it's, uh <-huh>. about, <laughs> it's about <laughs> finding your dominant clair. Are you clairvoyant? Are you claircognizant? Are you clair sentient are you clear um clear audience because every single person as as you know receives guidance in different ways what are you by the way i find i get things with visions like just okay. in my mind or again i'll get like a sentence or something and i'm like what where did that come from like or sometimes i'll ask for things and it's shown to me in different ways like something pops up or like my friends like here talk to this person i'm like oh great so different, a little couple different ways yes. it comes to me. Yeah. But definitely the visions are the strongest ones. Uh, as soon as we find what our dominant uh, Claire, Claire is, uh, I call them intuition languages or intuition types, then mm -hmm. receiving the guidance is just second nature. Do you feel that everyone is a light worker or like some people are born as light workers and there's uh, others that are, that are awakening to I that? Love, I love this question. <laughs> so let, let, me, let me define the term. So a light worker is anyone who has an urge or a purpose or a calling to help make the world a better place by being in it. So anyone can be a light worker if we have, if they have this purpose, this urge, this calling, especially from a young age. Oh, I feel like making a change in the world. I don't know what that change will be, but I feel like I want my presence to mean something in the world. I mm -hmm. want, so their purpose usually goes beyond their personal well being and it extends to the global well being. So, this is usually what uh, determines who, what a light worker is. So, there are two aspects to that, to that definition is strong sense of purpose and that mm -hmm. purpose extending to global, like globally. Now, in the book, I talk about the Ascension Lightworkers. And specifically, this book, Lightworkers Gotta Work, is not for every single lightworker. Mm -hmm. I am not speaking to um, lightworkers outside of spirituality. I was, I'm very conscious about what my purpose is, because my purpose is to help lightworkers to find, follow, and fulfill their life purpose. And the light workers I choose to focus on because that's who I can serve best are light workers within the mind, body, spirit world, the new age world, the spiritual world, whatever you want to call it. So this is a book for spiritual healers, intuitives, witches, spiritual entrepreneurs, um, psychics. So anyone who wants to help make the world a better place through their spiritual work. 
I mean, of course, any other light worker will still find benefit from the book, but if you're a muggle light worker reading mm -hmm. that, then you'd be like, what is he talking about? Because I talk about <laughs> like gods and goddesses and altars and, and star bathing and moon bathing. They'd be like, he's cuckoo. And I wouldn't blame them. <laughs> yeah, that's the stuff but, that I like. I'm like, yeah. bring it on. I like it. <laughs> and then specifically, Ascension light workers. Now, if, like, Ascension light workers is basically a different term for spiritual light workers because most spiritual light workers would identify as Ascension light workers. Therefore, this group of light workers who came here with the purpose of ascending the world, not maintaining the status quo but revolutionizing, by creating something new, by creating uh, a new earth in a way. Mm -hmm. I work a lot with uh, veterans or people who have been diagnosed with PTSD. And the thing they struggle with the most is like refining their purpose after mm -hmm. having like, you know, whether it was a physical injury that caused that or an incident that caused PTSD, like whatever the cause was, their biggest thing is like, how do I heal? myself how do I find myself again and then how do I find my purpose and do you have a message like maybe specifically for that group or like we like to call it trauma with a capital T because really pretty much everyone has probably some kind of trauma they're dealing with and they can kind of get lost so how would you recommend like they come back to that light to that purpose what is, would you suggest for them so in the book, I have the first part, it's called Find Your Purpose. And I guide people through a step-by-step -step formula to not just finding their purpose in generic terms, but really defining it in a two paragraph definition. So it's a very practical process of, at the end of, the, of that part, people will have a two paragraph definition of what my life purpose is. Mm -hmm. And in essence, the basis of this process is going back to our childhood and happy moments in our lives and identifying what were the people, the activities, the interests that we've had in those um, happy moments. Why happiness? Because happiness is who we are at a very soul basis. And it's therefore who God, the universe, source mm -hmm. is. Okay. And if source is all knowing, therefore source knows what our life purpose is. So then we have source, happiness, and our life purpose being synonyms. So if we find either one of the three, then we automatically know the other two. <laughs> so when we mm -hmm. start following the breadcrumbs of happiness of our lives and making connections between things that made us happy in different aspects and different times of our lives and bringing those together, those can lead us to what our life purpose is. Of course, when you have gone through trauma, then you have obstacles to that happiness. So mm -hmm. the priority becomes resolving the obstacle that's blocking you from experiencing that happiness. So I'm sure the work you do is so important then because you're helping people overcome that kind of trauma. I think that should be the focus in those kind of cases. I mean, I'm not a psychotherapist, but mm -hmm. I've been through traumas myself. <laughs> yeah. And I guide people through healing their past life traumas. I do a lot of past life therapy through regression uh, work. And uh, in my experience, when that trauma is resolved, then they experience a massive shift in their daily lives and they're able to have a better idea of what makes them happy in the first place. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a different way of shaking things up. Basically, yes. Um, I also wanted to ask you, like something that I haven't really gotten to talk to a lot about on the show yet is like that psychic protection, the psychic attacks, like... There's some times like personally on like my page, I'll talk about it or with people I'll talk about it. And when I seen that brought up and what you had sent me, I was like, oh yes, perfect time to talk about it. <laughs> so that's something like, I feel like just in general, everyone's looking to feel safe. So we can always give them tools like here's to protect your energy, here's to protect your aura. But I love the wording you, you use. So I'll just like ask you to dive into that. Like what is those psychic attacks? How can they protect themselves? Give us some tools or even definitions of what those mean. So we all have an energy field known as the aura. And our aura is like a sponge. It can both absorb energy, but it can also send energy. So as we walk mm -hmm. through life, we leave our own energetic imprint on the surrounding space or people's energy. 
And at the same time, we absorb energy from our surrounding space and from people. Specifically, mm -hmm. in the book, I talk about five types of psychic intrusions or psychic attack. I talk about daggers of attack and jealousy that other people send towards us. Mm -hmm. I talk about um, cords of attachment, toxic cords of attachment that we establish to people. I talk about residual spatial energy, which is energy we absorb from the surrounding environment. I talk about collective thought patterns, which are collective thoughts that have gave, gained enough power that they can affect our own way of thinking and energy. And I talk about low level spirits that are spirits that have been manifested again by negative thoughts and energy that can attach themselves on our aura and really uh, drain us of our own energy. So these are the things we have to be aware of. And in the book, I guide th people through a three step process. A, identifying all that I have done eight downloadable meditations in the book that people can download. And uh, these are primarily in the um, protect your light energy protection section, where I guide people through a meditation to scan their aura and identify what's there. And then next step is clearing all that with different processes, primarily uh, elemental processes. We work with dragons, we work with the sylphs, we work with mm -hmm. the unicorns. And then the third step to the process is all about shielding and protecting your aura. And therefore wearing an energetic shield that repels uh, negativity. And what I want to share here is when I tell people I teach about psychic protection, sometimes I hear, well, George, if I put my attention on protecting myself, I'm a, aren't I feeding fear? Aren't I attracting that energy towards me? And yes and no, because when you believe in psychic attack, then you're vulnerable to psychic attack and you have to do something about it. If you don't believe it and you can honestly say you don't believe that you can attract energy from anyone, then that is your psychic protection tool, <laughs> that belief. So you got to work with your belief system. Personally, I know about energy. I am aware my belief system is such that I believe that I can be affected by other people's energy. So mm -hmm. I take the time to protect my energy. So this is some, this is everyone's personal choice. Cause I see people telling me I'm untouchable. Nothing can touch me. I don't believe mm -hmm. in BS. I'm like, great. That is your protection. You don't need anything. <laughs> but if you do believe, <laughs> if you do believe it, then do something about it. Don't just leave yourself vulnerable. And the other thing is, because we're light workers, because we're so sensitive, we, it's easier for us to absorb negative energy than a muggles, okay? Mm -hmm. At the same time, we are exposed to, um, to social interactions, not just offline anymore, but online as well. So there are so many more outlets that we can receive energy from other people. So because of these reasons, because of our sensitivity, the increase of uh, social interactions, the um, awakening of so many more people in using energy and energy work because of these reasons we have to be extra careful and extra protective of our energy because if we're not and we're allowing other people's energy to affect our own then our thoughts and our emotions are not really ours and neither are our actions and therefore we're not really working our light we're working other people's egos Oh, such a good definition of putting it. Cause I find when I first started doing like energy work on other people, like I was like losing weight, like crazy. And I'm like, Oh, it's because I'm giving them all my energy. Like, and I'm letting them take it from me, but you're right. I never thought about it like that. Yes. You've been establishing a cord, but then you have to cut the cord. Otherwise they're mm -hmm. draining all the energy from you. Yes. And then I'm like, I need to sleep forever. <laughs> <laughs> You know, many, many people doing energy healing feel like, oh, this is normal. I'm supposed to be down all the time because I'm giving energy to other people. That is not normal. And that's something I also mm -hmm. had to learn because I was the same way. And then I realized that after each session, I have to cut the cord mm -hmm. so that I can move on and therefore compartmentalize. How did you first like start being, feeling, discovering that you are a light worker. I always like asking that because anyone that watches these episodes, like I want people to know like, hi, like we're real people. Like we've been through real things. <laughs> so just kind of sharing like your background a little bit and how you yeah. found your awakening. 
oh, I've been through some real, real things. <laughs> <laughs> so it, I'm, I'm going to take you back to when I was 13 years old, actually when mm -hmm. I was five, because growing up in, um, in Cyprus, a very small island, like not even a million like, people here. So with small communities, they tend to be very judgmental. So from a very young age, I felt like I stood out from the crowd because I was a kid that talked to flowers and looked mm. up to the, to the sky and it was like, what is the purpose of life? So I was like a weirdo, like I couldn't care less about going out and playing in the park. I just wanted to ask questions and communicate with the flowers. So from a very young age, that created a sense of, okay, I'm different and I have to work towards becoming accepted by other people. Mm. And that carried me through my entire childhood. And as a result, I was bullied a lot at school because of all those different uh, aspects of, m that made me different. So when I was 13 years old and I realized I was gay, I could not accept that because at, at that time, homosexuality was illegal in Cyprus. Actually, I think it had just been legalized. So it was still a big taboo. People thought mm -hmm. that gay people were criminals or pedophiles. So how could I take on yet another label after all the labels mm -hmm. that had been put on me? So I'm like, okay, I can't be gay. So I'm just going to change myself from gay to straight one step at a time. I thought I could do that. So for two years, I tried to monitor the way I looked. I tried to monitor the way I walked and expressed myself to ensure I don't look gay and even forcing myself to think straight thoughts, if that even, mm. that, that's even a thing. These were the two most debilitating and depressing years of my life because I was putting myself through hell. I was self-loathing, I was self-monitoring, I was self-judgment to its maximum. And then two years later, when I realized I couldn't change myself, I called myself a human abomination and decided that my only way out was to take my own life. Mm -hmm. And it was in that moment, just before I was ready to put an end to it, I had written a letter to my parents and I was like, I'm just gonna kill myself. And that's when I had an epiphany and I saw the answer I, have, I had been seeking, an answer that was already available to me, but I just couldn't see it because I was resisting it so much. Mm -hmm. And that answer was, fuck what people say, Fuck what people think and just learn to love and accept yourself exactly as you are. Mm. And I didn't know how to love and accept myself because all I knew was self-loathing. All I knew was self-judgment, but I was willing to learn and to learn to love and accept myself. And that's when I discovered spirituality. I started from Feng Shui. It promised to mm -hmm. change my life by changing my room furniture <laughs> and like the decoration. <laughs> then I discovered Cute. these hey and affirmations and meditation and the law of attraction. So step by step, I started healing the demons of my past, forgiving myself, forgiving my bullies, learning to love myself. And that mm -hmm. culminated in my first book, Be the Guru, which was all about learning to find happiness and acceptance and fulfillment within mm -hmm. you without needing other people's approval. And that, that was my path basically to uh, getting onto my spiritual path and committing to helping others find that fulfillment within them. Everyone, I feel like, really can relate to that feeling of being powerless, like, or like giving your power over to something or someone else. So even just that title, like be your own girl, like take your power back, you have the answers. And I like use the slogan a lot, know thyself, because like from that, there's just everything. Like that's how you know what you're supposed to be doing. That's how you can heal everything. That's how you're going to meet the right people, find abundance. So thank you so much for sharing your personal story in that way. And now I'm like, you're just so you. Like when I, as soon as you came on the video, I was like, there he just is. That's him. Like just fully you. It's great. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share this story. And I hope um, whenever I share this story, of course, it's hard for me to share it because I'm sharing something very, a very dark period of my life. Mm -hmm, and but vulnerable. The, the very fact that I know that someone hearing this story will feel empowered to learn to love and accept myself, that's all I need. Do you have any like final things you'd like to share or words of wisdom or anything else that you'd like to share? I'd like to leave people with, with a question, a few questions actually. I want you to imagine what it would look like if 
you had a crystal clear definition of your life purpose and you knew when to surrender and when to take action towards that purpose, how would you and the world be different if you showed up with this amount of clarity every single day? That is the promise of Lightworkers Gotta Work. And it is a love letter from me to you, Lightworker, and a call to action as well to step up your game, to not be a light chiller, but really be a light worker. Wonderful. Um, and maybe just share like how people can connect with you, like website, email, whatever form you'd like to share. Yes. Firstly, I'd love to hang out with you on Instagram. So you can find me there at George Lizos. Or you can join my Facebook group, Your Spiritual Toolkit, which is where I share daily inspiration and guidance. YouTube as well, I have weekly videos all about um, spirituality and wellness, including my podcast, The Lit Up Lightworker Podcast. And of course, um, I would love for you to go and pre-order my book, Lightworkers Gotta Work on Amazon. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me and I'll include all these in the show notes as well. Thank you so much, George. Thank you so much for having me.